Welcome everybody uh, again to our Astana virtual talks. As you know, this series was started uh, last year and has now gained quite some traction. Um, my name is Andreas uh, Strebinger. I'm the um, head of the Toronto and South Central Canada chapter. And I'm happy that we have one of our uh, most brilliant young scholars uh, uh, today as the presenter of a fascinating topic uh, where he will report on uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans. I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, somehow correctly um, and how they are living on the edge uh, and the edge was uh, Central Asia as far um, as I uh, see it. And uh, Benje um, is uh, currently assistant professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto. Um, before that, he has been working in Bordeaux in France and in Vienna and also four years, uh, four years at the Max Planck uh, Institute in Leipzig, uh, Germany. And uh, he's pursuing an interdisciplinary approach to his studies um, involving, uh, well, different approaches from genetics, um, as well as um, historical approaches, if I understand it correctly, but he will uh, show us what he's doing and how he's uh, coming up with his fascinating findings in his talk. So without much further ado, um, welcome everybody and I hand over to Benje. Hi. Um, um... Thank you very much for the invitation. Let me just uh, share my, uh, my presentation for a start. Um, thanks a lot both to uh, Olaf Asina and Andreas for, uh, for the invitation and uh, an opportunity to speak. Um, so as, as Andreas mentioned, I'm an, I'm an anthropologist. I'm actually a paleoanthropologist. I study human evolution. And I try to combine um, methods from archeology, span from genetics, and from, from biological anthropology to better understand what was going on in the past. And my focus for the last, um, it's actually 17 or 18 years now, has been on Central Asia. Central Asia has been seen for, for a long time as really kind of at the edge of the, of the human experience. Um, one group that I'm especially interested in are the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are probably the best known fossil humans, uh, first discovered in 18, 1856 in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, um, where um, workers uh, excavating uh, a cave, um, mostly to get um, the cave sediments to use them for, for, for phosphate, um, so as fertilizer, um, they found some. Uh, they found some bones, and they didn't recognize them right away as anything important. But the local um, uh, school teacher uh, Joachim Fulroth, um recognized that these are actually very human-like, and there was a long discussion going on about these these bones that you see here, until it was finally understood that they actually represent a group that is either either our ancestor or at least very closely related. Um, our views of Neanderthals have changed a lot over time. Um, in the beginning, Neanderthals were seen as something very different from us. Um, today, Neanderthal reconstructions actually emphasize the similarity to uh, modern humans. Morphologically, we know that Neanderthals are, are extremely similar to us. Um, you can distinguish them. You know, If you have a complete skeleton, it's easy. Um, even with isolated teeth, it's frequently possible. Um, but in general, it's pretty clear that if you would see a Neanderthal, um, you'd have a hard time telling that this is something completely different from us. Um, you know, if you'd have a Neanderthal dressed well on the subway, um, you'd probably think, you know, that's an ugly guy, um, but not necessarily that it's a different species than we are. Um, we know Neanderthals quite well because um, Europe has probably the, the, the most archaeological research of, uh, of any continent, and this was kind of the, the main homeland of the Neanderthals. Um, and so Neanderthal fossils have been found for, for 170 years now, actually even more, because there were some found even before they were recognized as Neanderthals, both in Gibraltar and Belgium. 
Um, so we have the remains of hundreds of individuals, but most of them are only isolated teeth or little bone fragments. We have about a dozen uh, relatively complete skeletons and crania, and we have everything from the baby to the grandpa. So we know quite a bit about their growth, about their development, and about their lives. So Neanderthals were thought to be a primarily European species until discoveries showed that they were actually a bit more, uh, they extended a bit further uh, away. Um, even today, most of the fossils are in Europe, in particular in Western Europe. Um, France and Spain are probably the, the countries that have the most fossils. But we also have Neanderthals from the Near East, from Israel, from Syria, from Turkey, um, Iran. And uh, even in the, in the area that I'm interested in, in, in uh, Central and Northern Asia. Um, this area is interesting because you know, people usually think it's, it's, it's kind of the end of the world, um, but it's not really historical. If you think about it, you know, the Silk Road connecting um, the Far East uh, to, uh, to Europe went through this region. And so in many ways, the Silk Road and, and Central Asia served as a connection between East and West. And, and my opinion is that this was also true in the past. And I think the discoveries that we've made over the last 20 years um, um, kind of support this idea. Um, I'm going to focus today on, on a site in Siberia in the Altai Mountains uh, at uh, the Niseva Cave, but we actually have Neanderthals or similar remains also at other sites, two more in Siberia, Okladnikov and Chigirskaya Caves, um, and then a couple in, um, in what you'd call Central Asia Sensu Stricto in Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and, and, uh, and uh, even in Tajikistan at Tashiktash, Obirahmat, and Selungur, and then the material from the Caucasus and, and, uh, and the Middle East. This idea that Central Asia is not relevant for our past is actually something that only came up in the, in the mid 20th century. Um, if we go back to the 1920s, there actually was a gigantic expedition, Roy Chapman Andrews, who kind of served as the role model for Indiana Jones. He was a very co colorful character. He was a curator at the American Museum of Natural History. And he actually, he's, there are all these pictures of him with a hat and a, he didn't have a whip, but he always wore a gun um, on his excavations. Um, he organized an expedition um, into Central Asia, um, mostly into what is today Mongolia and, and what was referred to as Inner Mongolia, so Xinjiang in China, looking for uh, human ancestors. Um, this was in the 1910s and early 1920s. Um, this region is relatively hard to access. It was even, even worse then. So he actually, he had two cars, but then he also had 200 camels that carried all the, all the gas for his cars because that was the only way to, to get around. Um, he didn't find any human remains, but he discovered the first dinosaur fossils in the Gobi Desert, um, which, you know, is also pretty cool. Um, the first evidence for the presence of fossil humans in the region was, uh, was a discovery by a Russian archaeologist, by Alexander Okladnikov, who in 1938 um, found this cranium and a few more um, uh, bone fragments of a Neanderthal child, and about 10 to 12 year old, uh, we think likely it's a boy, um, in a cave called Teshiktash in Uzbekistan in the, in the so-called Baisun mountain range. Um, what was important about this, this fossil uh, was that this was the first evidence for Neanderthals uh, existing so far, uh, so far east. What is interesting, though, is that um, usually it was always said, you know, Tashiktash is just another Neanderthal. But one of the most uh, important anthropologists at the time, Franz Weidenreich, who was a, a, German, a, German, a German Jew who had, to, who had to flee from Germany due to the Nazis rising and then was in China. Um, he's the, he, he was the first uh, di, uh, di, uh, person to study the Peking man remains from Shukudian. Um, Franz Weidenreich actually studied this specimen in Moscow. And in his opinion, uh, he said, you know, this is something that's actually kind of halfway between Neanderthals and modern humans. And this was, this was pretty much uh, forgotten later on. And it was, it's gonna be interesting for a discussion later on.
So I'm going to take you now to the to the Altai Mountains um, in Siberia. Um, you know, when you hear about Siberia, you imagine a, a, a horrible um, uh, icy wasteland. Um, the Altai Mountains are not like that at all. This is, of course, the very southern tip of Siberia. Um, it's roughly the same latitude as uh, as the south of Germany. So, for example, the Nisova Cave that will will uh, focus on is exactly the, exactly the same latitude as uh, as uh, Leipzig uh, in Germany. So you're looking at a middle mountain range with uh, mixed uh, uh, mixed both deciduous and and and, uh, and needle forests and uh, a relatively relatively pleasant environment. You know, extremely continental, cold in the cold in the winter, um, but relatively warm in the summer, um, and likely. You know, about fifty to hundred thousand years ago, the environment was quite similar to today. Also, um, a bit of a mosaic, which is always an advantage because it gives you uh, many opportunities for um, subsistence. So, the most famous site in the Altai is the Nisova Cave, um, a cave that was named after a hermit from the 18th century, Denis, who who lived in this cave. Um, and here we are actually, we're standing above the cave and looking down into the valley of the Anui River, a small river that uh, flows uh, out of the, uh, that, that flows uh, through part of the Altai and passes uh, several other sites as well. Um, and as you can see here, there's a little, uh, little camp. Um, my Russian colleagues have been working at Denisova since 1982 and actually built uh, an amazing uh, research infrastructure with, uh, with uh, little houses for for housing students, with labs, and actually even a conference center on the on the left, um, where they where they organize international conferences. Um, it's really it's a it's a beautiful environment. Um, this is the entrance to the cave itself. The cave is about twenty meters above the level of the river, and faces uh, and faces kind of west, mostly mostly towards the west. Um, there are several several openings. You see, there's the main opening, and then on the right, on the bottom, there's a there's a, a separate little um, exit uh, um, as well that leads us into the so-called south gallery of the cave. Um, what is important to know about this cave is that it was not only inhabited uh, in the far past, but also relatively recently. So there's a lot of activity by Scythians in uh, roughly 2,500 years ago, who were burying their dead in the cave. So there's about, um, um, I think, 50, 50 Scythian burials as well. And these guys were making a mess. They were just you know, digging holes everywhere to put their dead in. And they screwed up everything for us. Um, it's also important to keep in mind that you know, these caves are, were primarily not inhabited by humans. The primary inhabitants of all these sites were carnivores. And in the case of Denisova, that's pretty clearly um, cave bears and cave hyenas, and even sometimes cave lions. Um, but of course, again, these carnivores also do a lot of, uh, do a big mess. They also dig holes and enjoy uh, creating a bit of chaos. Um, the sediments in the cave, um, there's about two meters of Holocene sediments. So uh, from the last 10,000 years on top, which I left away because I don't care about anything younger than 10,000 years. Um, and then you have um, Pleistocene sediments going back to likely about 300,000 years, but we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, as you can see here in these stratigraphic sections, um, I know few of you are archeologists or geologists, so you're not used to it. Um, so these are the different layers in the cave. And you can see here, especially in the main chamber that there's a lot of, lot of complex stuff going on. Um, and this is a bit of a problem for us. So it's gonna, it's, it's very hard in Denisova to figure out um, which horizons are contemporaneous. And also, you know, in these caves, we find lots of animal bones, we find some stone tools, we find some human remains. It's hard to figure out which, um, which things go with which one. So it's very hard for us to tell which humans produced, for example, which industry. And, uh, and, and which human group um, 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 kill these animals because we just don't, uh, uh, because it's, it's, it's very complicated. There's what we call post-depositional mixing of stuff moving around. Um, you know, you can't help this. It's, uh, it's simply that way. Um, 
but uh, we always have to be careful with our interpretations. So another problem is, of course, you know, we're always interested in how old various horizons in the cave are. Another problem is, is that a lot of this is beyond the range of radiocarbon dating. Um, radiocarbon dating or C14 dating is the most precise way of, of dating uh, archaeological material. Um, you know, with in this time range, maybe with an uh, with a, an error range of 500 years or so, which you know seems a lot, but is is actually quite precise. Um, but if you get beyond 40,000 years, that doesn't work anymore, and you have to work with other methods, um, things like optically stimulated luminescence. Um, and uranium series dating, which have error ranges in, in many cases of tens of thousands of years. So um, we know quite well in the upper part how old sediments and, and human remains are, but in the lower part, it's, it's a bit harder. We think that the oldest things in the cave go back to about 300,000 years, um, which I'm, I'm a little skeptical of this. This does not fit very well with some of the fauna. I think 200,000 is more likely, but you know, you see here the, the error range, for example, in the center, I think I can't, um, yeah, I can't, I can't point at anything. If you look in the, in the, in the central column here, where it says main chamber, the first date that you see on the left is 280,000 plus minus 41,000. The issue is here, the 41,000 is one standard deviation. So if you want to go relatively sure, and you want to say, you want to stay within a two standard deviation range, you're between 200,000 and, and 300 and, um, and uh, what is that 300 and um, roughly 350,000 years. So it's, you know, it's, it's not very accurate. Anyway, um, the amazing thing in the Nisaba cave, of course, is that we have fossils. Um, it's one of the very few sites in Central Asia where we have archaeological data and fossils as well. Um, many of the fossils are not very spectacular. So this here is the most important fossil from Denisova that made Denisova famous. And as you can see, it looks like a you know, tiny piece of dirt. It is actually a small fragment of a finger bone of a roughly 14 to 15 year old girl. Um, and as you can see here in these micro CT scans, it actually consists of two parts. You have in blue, you have the articular surface. So this is the joint between the last part of your finger, uh, the last segment and, uh, and the middle phalanx. Um, and then in green, you have a little bit left of the shaft. So we know the age of this individual because the shaft and the joint, um, I mean, the epiphyses and the diaphyses weren't uh, fused yet. Um, these grow together uh, over time. Now, you know, first you'd say, what is the point of even having a fossil like this? Um, and, you know, morphologically, I completely agree with you. So seeing this bone, you know, I, I can tell that it's, a, that it's a primate. I can even tell that it's a hominoid, so it's an ape. But beyond that, I, I couldn't tell you very much. You know, this could be just as well a chimpanzee, and I, I couldn't distinguish it. Of course, the amazing thing is that today we have approaches that, uh, that allow us to access the DNA as well. And we'll, uh, we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Um, but we also had some other fossils. So this is one of my favorite fossils from uh, Denisova Cave, uh, Denisova IV, which is a, an absolutely gigantic molar. Um, so it's an upper third molar, so the wisdom tooth. Um, and it is in, in uh, if you look at its surface area, roughly three times as large than what you'd see in an average modern human. Um, it's most comparable in size and shape actually to hominins that lived um, about 1.8 million years ago. Um, when, I, when I first saw this, and it was really one of my Russian colleagues pulled it out of his shirt pocket and showed it to me, I, I looked at this and I thought this is this is completely impossible. I have seen similar teeth before, but they came from from East Africa and they belong to a species called Homo rudolfensis that disappeared one and a half million years ago. And of course, I knew that um, the Nisva cave is quite a bit younger than that. Um, so what is interesting about this tooth is number one, it's large size. Number two, also it has these really massive roots that are kind of uh, standing apart. 
which is interesting because that is very different from what we see in modern humans, but also from what we see in Neanderthals. So this was a first hint that there's something, um, something weird going on here. In general, its crown shape also is quite, uh, quite different from what we see in Neanderthals and looks more similar, as I said, to um, more archaic humans. But of course, you know, the finger bone was, was interesting because we managed to extract DNA from it. Um, so since the, in, in the mid 1980s, people started to explore ways to um, access DNA from originally just from archeological material. So the first studies were on Egyptian mummies and they managed to extract DNA from Egyptian mummies showing that, you know, DNA preserves for thousands of years. And then in 1997, um, Svante Pebo, who was at the time at the University of, of Munich, um, managed to extract DNA from a Neanderthal and showed that the mitochondrial DNA of this Neanderthal is distinct from what we see in, uh, in any modern human, showing that this is not an ancestor of modern humans, but a, a, but a kind of a sister group to modern humans. So, uh, so Ancient DNA is an amazing approach, but it has quite a few problems. It's hard to do because um, DNA is usually not very well preserved. It also has the issue that it's destructive. Um, so what you have to do is actually, you have to drill out a little bit of the bone powder, then you use um, you know, various chemicals to break down the, um, the protein that's in there and, and separate uh, only the DNA. Then you amplify the DNA using a uh, a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction, and then you sequence it. You know, in reality, this is a, it's a bit more complicated than on this slide, um, but uh, you, should, you should get the uh, idea. And you'd think, okay, you have the DNA sequence, you can just compare that. The problem is that, um, is that DNA does not preserve very well in, uh, for, uh, over long periods. So if you look at recent, at recent bone, for example, you get about one microgram of DNA per gram of tissue. If you're looking at fossil bone, um, you get much, much, much less. Um, another problem is, of course, is contamination. If you have recent DNA, you know, you work with recent human DNA, you know, you can get a, you can get a little bit of bacterial DNA, but usually you have much more human DNA than anything else. With fossils, your first problem is you have about um, one million fold less DNA than in recent tissue. And also the DNA breaks down over time. You don't have it as continuous strands anymore. You have tiny, tiny pieces. So um, you have to imagine, you know, if you imagine the DNA as a book, you put the book through a shredder and what comes out at the end is what you're left with. And, you know, you also take about 99.99% uh, .99 of what you have and you burn it and you just keep 0.1% of the shredded book and then use that to reconstruct um, what, what the book was about, which as you can imagine is a little bit hard. So the DNA breaks up into tiny pieces. Um, usually we have fragments that are at most 50 base pairs long, so 50 letters. And besides that, not only does the DNA, is there very little DNA, it's in tiny pieces, but also um, it gets damaged over time. Luckily, we understand today how this damage works and where the damage is usually located. It's at the ends of these fragments and it's very characteristic um, um, changes. Um, but, you know, you also have changes to the DNA and then usually because, you know, these fossils uh, or these bones were lying in the soil for thousands or tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, there's also lots of DNA from other creatures in it, from bacteria and from fungi and so on that were growing in these bones. So the, what we call the endogenous DNA the DNA of the individual is usually less than 1% of, uh, of all the DNA that we get out of this thing. And of course, um, because um, you have so much less DNA, contamination plays a much, much larger role. And this was kind of the, the bane of ancient DNA research in the beginning. In the 1990s, in the early 1990s, there were a bunch of studies um, uh, trying to extract, for example, dinosaur DNA. And they actually got DNA when they were studying these, these dinosaur bones. Um, but some of it was later turned out to, to be uh, chicken DNA. You know, somebody had a chicken sandwich for lunch and then went to the lab and didn't work very clear, uh, cleanly. 
and other things were actually uh, human DNA. Um, today we know that you know the, the the oldest DNA we can we can get these days is uh, in the range of a few hundred thousand years. There's a there's a single horse bone from the Yukon that uh, is about 800,000 years old from which people managed to extract DNA. But you know, that was in a gigantic freezer for 800,000 years. Um, from from non-frozen bones, the oldest stuff is about 380,000 years old. So we have, you know, a few time limits. Dinosaurs are definitely not happening. Anyway, by 2009, when this finger bone was found, the methodology was, was pretty well there and people were able to extract relatively complete, uh, at least mitochondrial genomes from bones already. And we already had the mitochondrial genome of Neanderthals. So when we got the mitochondrial DNA of this finger bone, um, Let's digress a little bit. So, so I, I did my PhD on the human remains from Central Asia, studying the fossils, not with DNA, just morphologically. And so I knew Denisova cave uh, quite well. There were already two teeth known from there. They were much less diagnostic than this big one found more recently. Um, and my assumption was always, you know, in Denisova cave, there's something weird going on, but I expected any fossils we'll find will be either Neanderthals or modern humans. Um, so when Johannes Krause, who was at the time working at the, at the Max Planck in Leipzig, um, called me and said, you know, he got DNA out of this finger bone in Denisova cave, I assumed, um, you know, it's going to be a Neanderthal or a modern human. The big surprise was that it was neither. It was, it was something different than a Neanderthal or a modern human. So in this phylogenetic tree here, you see um, modern humans on the left. Um, their closest relative uh, are Neanderthals. Um, uh, they separated about half a million years ago. Then you have this Denisova finger bone that separated from modern humans a million years ago. And then you have chimpanzees who separated from us about seven to 11 million years ago. Now this is purely based on mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA is great for these kind of analyses because there's lots and lots of mitochondrial D, uh, DNA in our cells. You know, each cell has, has uh, thousands of mitochondria. So you have thousands of copies of mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA is quite short. It's whatever, 17,000 base pairs. So it's easy to, uh, easy to reconstruct. There's one big problem with mitochondrial DNA though. Mitochondrial DNA gets inherited only along the maternal line. So your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mom and she got it from her mom and she got it from her mom and so on and uh, further back. Meaning that if you look at mitochondrial DNA, you only sample a very limited part of your ancestry. Um, in, you know, in the generation before you, you only have one of your two ancestors, only your mother contributed to it. If you go further back, it's one out of four ancestors, one out of eight, one out of 16, and so on. Also, mitochondrial DNA lineages get lost very easily exactly because of this. If, if, uh, if uh, an individual only has sons, its mitochondrial DNA is not passed on any, uh, any further. So mitochondrial DNA is not great, but at the time in 2009, when we did this, a nuclear DNA was still a little bit of a uh, yeah, kind of, a, kind of a dream that we'd be able to get uh, nuclear DNA, DNA out of fossils. Now, the amazing thing was that for some reason, and I, we still don't know why, DNA preservation in Denisova Cave is extremely good. I think it's mostly because it's a, it's a, cold, uh, it's a cold cave in a cold place. Um, but we actually were able, very soon after we published this, saying that, you know, this finger bone belongs to a, an up until now unknown population that we called the Denisovans. Um, very soon after, we got some nuclear DNA out as well. And the nuclear DNA gave us a very, very different picture actually. When we looked at the nuclear DNA of this individual, it turned out that it was closer related to Neanderthals than, uh, than to modern humans, or than also than Neanderthals are to modern humans with a common ancestor about 450, 500,000 years ago and a common ancestor for modern humans and uh, on the one side and Neanderthals and Denisovans on the other side about 650, 700,000 years ago. Now, um, this was, you know, this was, this was pretty cool. Um, the other great thing about 
nuclear DNA is that once you have nuclear DNA, you can study the relationship between these past populations and recent modern humans in much more detail. Uh, so yes, we had this, you know, previously unknown population and we call them the Denisovans. So let's compare the DNA we have from Denisovans and also from Neanderthals to modern humans. And so in our first study, we compared them to five modern human populations. Two from Africa, um, Khoisan from South Africa, Yoruba from Nigeria, um, French from France, of course, um, uh, Chinese and two uh, Australian Aborigines and also uh, Papuan, uh, Papuans from Melanesia. So what you do in this analysis, it's called uh, the, the uh, Patterson's D-statistics is uh, in the end, you just check in the genome, you compare four individuals, um, uh, two modern humans and archaic humans. So the archaic would be a Neanderthal or a Denisovan and a chimpanzee. And you check um, uh, which of the modern humans the Neanderthal is more similar to. And normally if you know, you'd think that all modern humans are equally distant from Neanderthals. But what you actually find is that Neanderthals are more similar to some modern humans than to others. And it's not a, not a huge uh, similarity, um, but it, it, it makes a difference. So what I, I'm just showing here is kind of the, uh, our idea of how modern humans expanded out of, uh, out of Africa. The ancestor of, of all modern humans today left Africa probably about 100,000 years ago and expanded across the globe. Um, there's still a lot of discussion. You know, it was not a directed migration or anything. You kind of have to imagine it as a, as a Brownian uh, random movement in some ways, likely following herds of animals, following ecological um, uh, zones that they can uh, live in easily and so on. But when we compare this Neanderthal DNA um, um, to, to various human populations, we see that um, African populations um, are kind of our baseline. They, they, are, they, are, they are the most distant from Neanderthals. They're 0% similarity to Neanderthals. Um, Europeans are 1% to 3% more similar to Neanderthals than African populations are. And the same is true for, uh, for East Asian populations and for Melanesian populations. So because the similarities to Neanderthals are, are so, 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 so strong and, and so comparable between these three populations, we think that, the, um, that this is due to gene flow from Neanderthals into modern humans that happened likely very soon after they left uh, Africa, somewhere in the, in the Near East possibly. Now we repeated the same analyses using Denisovan DNA. And what we found is that, you know, there's 0% Denisovan DNA in Africa, there's 0% in Europe, there's a tiny bit in East Asia, um, but surprisingly, there is a huge amount of Denisovan DNA in Australia. And, you know, this, um, at the time, and even today mostly, we only knew Denisovans from a single cave in Siberia. And then you find that present day Australians and Papuans carry about 5% of Denisovan DNA. That's a bit of a surprise. So the way we see today, uh, the relationships between these different populations is as a complicated network. We find that whenever modern humans, as they, as they moved out of Africa, whenever they met archaic populations, they likely interbred with them. We have gene flow from, uh, from uh, Neanderthals into modern human, uh, humans, from Denisovans into modern humans, but we also see gene flow from modern humans into Neanderthals, and we see gene flow between Neanderthals and Denisovans, and even from some other group that we don't know exactly who they are into Denisovans. So what is clear is all these populations recognized each other as potential mating partners, which you know comes back to this idea that you might think that a Neanderthal is ugly, but you know if the cave is dark, maybe maybe you'll you'll make an exception. Um, so what was interesting in Denisova Cave, though, is that Denisovans were not the only inhabitants of Denisova Cave. Um, we found um, a year later we found this toe bone. Um, which is a, uh, the proximal phalanx of a, of a third or fourth toe. 
Um, and when we looked at its DNA, we found that its mitochondrial DNA is Neanderthal-like. It's not a Denisovan. It's more similar to Neanderthals that we knew from, from Europe in particular, uh, but also from the Caucasus. And we managed to extract DNA from this individual as well. And what is great now that we had both from this Neanderthal and from the Denisovan, we actually had a complete genome at you know, what we call high coverage. So very high quality DNA. We had each uh, position in the genome, we had between 30 and 40 reads. And this is important because a genome in the end samples two individuals. It samples both parents of, um, of this individual as well. And so if we compare the DNA that we see in the maternal and paternal copies of each chromosome, we can assess how closely related the parents of these individuals were. And so what is interesting is um, when you look at this, at what we call heterozygosity, um, you see that the Denisovans had quite a bit less genetic variation the two parents were more similar to each other than what you see, for example, in a, in a present day French individual. But what was really extreme is the individual that's labeled Altai here. So these graphs are more or less, it's one chromosome. And uh, the more different the, the, the parents are in a, in a certain part of the, of the genome, the higher the red line goes up. Um, as you can see in Altai, there's huge parts of this chromosome where the two parents were completely identical. And so um, this leads us to, uh, uh, to um, um, uh, conclude not only were these, uh, did these Neanderthals live in very small populations probably, but also that actually the parents of this individual were much more closely re related than we think is healthy. Um, so actually using modeling, we, we figured out the most likely is that you're looking either at double first cousins, meaning that um, both parents of this individual were uh, were um, were siblings, at grandfather grandfather and granddaughter, at half siblings or uh, uncle and niece. Um, so this is you know this is like Habsburg style inbreeding uh, going on here. Um, this seems to be uh, pretty normal in Neanderthals, though. Um, we have now Neanderthals from other sites as well, where we have good DNA, and we see similarly um, very. Very, very strong inbreeding. This is likely simply because they lived in, in very small and isolated populations. We can actually also use um, this, uh, these methods. We can look at heterozygosity and we can actually um, reconstruct changes in population size over time um, using a method called partial sequential Markovian coalescence. Um, and what is interesting is that we can use this to kind of date to uh, date uh, when Neanderthals and Denisovans moved out of Africa. And we think this happened about uh, 700,000 years ago. That's when they separated from our ancestors. Um, and what is interesting is that after this, they just were, were uh, losing genetic diversity. They never really increased in population size, at least uh, these ones that we, uh, that we know. Um, so if there's all this contact going on, all this gene flow between these populations, um, the question is, is this even relevant? Um, you know, which uh, one of my colleagues who was always very opposed to this idea that there might've been gene flow between Neanderthals and modern humans, he said, oh, you know, but what does it matter? 1% of Neanderthal DNA, that's completely irrelevant. Um, we realize now over time that this is actually not true these small amounts of DNA we picked up from Neanderthals and Denisovans actually matter. We find that, for example, in, in, in some genes linked to the immune system in the, in the HLA, in the human leukocyte anti antigen system, um, there are variants that come from Neanderthals. And we think that this is because, and from Denisovans too. And we think this is simply because Neanderthals and Denisovans over hundreds of thousands of years uh, of living in Western and Eastern Eurasia adapted to the pathogens in their environment. And when modern humans came in and interbred with them, they picked up these, uh, these alleles that were clearly advantageous and, uh, and they, were, they were selected for later on. Even more extreme is uh, the case of uh, an adaptation in the EPAS1 gene, which is a gene linked to um, high altitude adaptation. 
So there's a variant that today only occurs in, in uh, Tibet, in, in Tibetan populations. It's in, uh, it's in pink on the lower right. And this variant in this, in this EPAS1 gene is something that today you only see in Tibet and it's very different from all modern humans elsewhere. There are several studies that show that Tibetan women who carry this variant um, have babies with a higher birth weight. So larger babies, um, which of course is an advantage because high birth weight is a, is a very important predictor of infant survival. Um, now, what is fascinating is that this variant we see in Tibet today is extremely similar to the variant we see in the Denisovan genome. And so uh, Huerta Sanchez and colleagues proposed that this likely came into Tibetans via gene flow. Now, of course, you'll ask yourself, um, if Denisovans live in Siberia and the Altai, um, which is not a very high mountain range, you know, Denisova cave is at 750 uh, meters above sea level, why are they adapted to high altitudes? Um, we'll get to that in a moment, but we are getting evidence that maybe some Denisovans at least did live at high altitudes. Um, all this gene flow, of course, didn't only happen between modern humans and Denisovans and Neanderthals. It also happened between Denisovans and Neanderthals themselves. And we made a fascinating discovery two years ago um, that showed us that actually this was going on in the Altai itself. This extremely unspectacular bone fragment comes from uh, some kind of long bone. And I, I spent about half a year trying to figure out which bone it could come from, and I have no idea. It's a tiny splinter uh, of bone that was digested by a hyena and then, and then either pooped out or thrown up. Hyenas regurgitate their bones as well. Um, and from this bone, we managed to extract DNA as well. And the fascinating thing is that the DNA we got out of this in uh, matches in certain parts in Neanderthals and in other parts, it matches uh, Denisovans. And uh, Vivian Sloan from the Max Planck, who, who, who led this analysis in the end, could show that this is because this individual is a hybrid. It had a Neanderthal uh, mother. And we know that the mother was Neanderthal because the mitochondrial DNA of this individual is uh, Neanderthal-like, but a Denisovan father. Um, and what is interesting is also that the father already carried um, some Neanderthal alleles. So likely this uh, uh, Denisovan population already met Neanderthals in the past and uh, received some gene flow from them. Um, so clearly, you know, about 100,000 years ago or 90,000 years ago, Neanderthals and Denisovans met in the Altai, um, interbred, and we have one of these individuals um, that was the result of this interbreeding. Um, clearly, the interbreeding can't be continuous because then they, uh, these two populations wouldn't be distinct genetically. Um, so this must have been only uh, ongoing whenever they met, and clearly they didn't meet um, um, that frequently. Um, just to kind of conclude, I'll show you a, 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 a few slides about what's, what's happening now. What, what are the newest things on Denisovans? Um, we're trying to still understand who these Denisovans really were. And, and one of the most exciting new results is that we have now Denisovans outside of Denisova Cave. So at the, at the site of Baishia Karst Cave in Xiahe in Tibet, Tibet um, uh, Chinese colleagues uh, found and identified this mandible, from which we still don't have DNA, but we have uh, uh, proteins from it, uh, ancient proteins. And the protein sequences we get from the enamel of this, uh, of, uh, of this individual are similar to the ones we see in the Denisovans. We also have Denisovan DNA from the sediments. So we have this mandible. And what is interesting is that this mandible is from relatively high up on the Tibetan plateau, from uh, an elevation of 3,700 meters above sea level which, um, you know, for a very long time, people never uh, didn't even think that uh, any, uh, that humans lived up there. It was usually assumed the Tibetan plateau was only settled in the last about 4,000 years. Um, this, uh, this mandible is uh, close to 300,000 years old. So um, it happened much earlier than we thought. But we also, we are also finding more fossils in Denisova cave. And probably the nicest uh, one of them is this here, which is a cranial fragment. It's a large part of the parietal, uh, of the back of the cranium. 
um, which is remarkable because it's, you know, it's much larger than anything else we had before. And it actually allows us to look a little bit at the shape of the head of these Denisovans. It's again, it's not a, it's not a huge fossil, um, but it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, what is remarkable about it is that it's extremely thick. And this, uh, this robusticity, the thickness of the cranium is something that we see much more frequently in, in uh, really early humans than in Neanderthals, for example. It's quite typical for Homo erectus, for example. Um, it also, um, in its shape, um, it's uh, quite similar to some relatively old specimens. So we reconstructed it using a, a cranium uh, called Kabwe from, uh, from Zambia. Um, which is interesting because um, Kabwe is one of the largest uh, human crania we have. This is an individual with a body mass of probably about 120 kilograms. And the Denisova cranial fragments are 13% larger than Kabwe. We actually had to inflate Kabwe to fit it to our, to our bone, which we, we mirrored here. And we then used uh, um, statistical methods called geometric morphometrics to uh, analyze and compare the shape of this cranial fragment to various um, past humans. And what is interesting, it, it falls outside the range of Neanderthals, but is actually quite similar to what you see in green here, which is Homo erectus. Um, <clears throat> so again, you know, a little bit of an indication that, that um, these Denisovans uh, at least carry some some traits that are that are a bit more primitive than uh, than Neanderthals. Um, we're also working at the moment trying to compare a lot of the Chinese fossil record to this uh, to this material. I'm pretty sure that some of the fossils known from China are Denisovans as well, but it's politically not very easy to get access to the material. They don't allow anything to be um, analyzed for ancient DNA and even morphologically just to see them is uh, in many cases um, very hard or, or even impossible. Um, but I think um, we, we, we are slowly uh, um, showing that our, that our history is much more complex than we, than we thought in the past. And that you know Central Asia played a much more important role than we uh, than we thought up until now. Um, you know all this research happened uh, in collaboration with a lot of people. I especially would like to to emphasize uh, Svante Pebo and his team in Leipzig, who who've been uh, who've done uh, uh, all these genetic analyses, and then my Russian colleagues Anatoly Derevyanko, Andrei Kugoshapkin, and. Uh, and co, uh, who have you know hosted me in Russia for many years and have uh, uh, spent many many months excavating various caves in in Central Asia uh, with me, which was always uh, a lot of fun. Anyway, uh, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Wait. Andreas, du bist, du bist uh, muted. Okay, thank you very much, Benche, for letting me know that I'm muted and also for this absolutely fascinating talk. I'm always like, uh, it's, it's unimaginable how much uh, information you uh, in paleontropology can pull out of you know, these little bones. So it's, it's uh, fascinating stuff. Um, so I open the floor for discussions. Um, we are approaching the end of the talk. Uh, so uh, I, I know that maybe some of you have to leave, but others may want to stay and uh, join us for this discussion. I'm uh, also uh, welcoming uh, Professor Masha and uh, Dr. Machor from uh, the embassy in Toronto, our deputy uh, head of the mission uh, in Ottawa, uh, of course, and director of the cultural forum. Uh, Austrian Cultural Forum in, in, in Ottawa. So without much further ado, um, I open the floor for the discussion. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so why do you think there's so little fossil record of the Denisovans? I mean, Neanderthals, I feel like there's a lot of, is it just because they live in an area that's more remote or? Um, Yes, I, I think a lot of it is is really just research history. You know, Europe has been has been excavated really extensively. Research in Central Asia is still very very limited. Um, 
also you might have issues with fossil preservation. Um, you know, based on the based on the genetic data, um, we think that they likely extended down into Southeast Asia as well. Um, in large parts of Southeast Asia, the climate is probably not very conducive to fossil preservation unless you have, you know, uh, you're very lucky. Um, I, I think that's the that's the most reason. There's probably also, I mean, I I have like a short list of uh, about eight to ten fossils just from China that I'm pretty sure are Denisovans. But um, when I was in Beijing for I was there for a month, uh, they allowed me to see two of them, and I wasn't allowed to see the rest. So wow. it was like, okay, um, <laughs> I'm I'm pretty sure they are they are this thing, and and but yeah, if you can't see them, it's kind of hard to tell. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, could I ask a quick question? Yes, of course. Yeah, so this was a great talk, very interesting. Uh, I wonder, are there, um, are there any animal records that sort of go along with, with the more human-like records so that one can sort of envisage the environment in which these these people lived or what yes. they ate or mm -hmm. like that. Yes, it's. I mean, we have a, a really like the, the the human fossils are maybe point uh, one uh, percent of of all the fossils. I mean, out of Denisova Cave, there's tens of thousands of animal bones, and uh, less than ten human bones. Um, so we can we can reconstruct the environment quite well. Um, it, it, it also changes over time, but uh, you have to imagine it was likely a, a kind of a mosaic environment. You had steps in the valleys and forests in the, in the, in the higher uh, or in the, at medium altitude and then at very high altitude, it was again, um, of course, um, like uh, mountain step. Um, the main animals they were hunting are uh, the Siberian ibex, um, uh, Capra siberica, so it's the Siberische Steinbock. Um, then they also uh, hunted quite a bit of red deer. In some cases, we also have evidence for, uh, for some mammoth and lots of bison. Um, Neanderthals especially like bison. Um, there's an interesting thing in Denisova Cave. One of the horizons that we think is quite clearly linked to Denisovans is uh, full of marmot bones, Murmurtia um, uh, knochen. And uh, with lots and lots of cut marks. And uh, so there's one indication that they might have been eating marmots. And we always make fun of the, the French paleontologist who, uh, who studied these and who, who noticed these marmot bones um, comes from the, from the Pyrenees. And he always t told us that in his village, uh, one of the local specialties is actually a stew made of marmot. Um, so clearly the Denisovans the were, uh, were doing that too. Um, then you have, of course, lots of lots of hyena and cave bear, but I don't think those were uh, usually eaten. Um, horse also occurs in in some of the localities. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I have a question, uh, which maybe uh, is tied to the uh, food that uh, the Denisovans consumed. Um, what's the explanation for the huge molars which you mentioned? That's a very good question. Um, I really don't know. Um, I, I do think they were likely very large. So especially the, the cranial uh, uh, fragment to me indicates that they were very large bodied. We had some populations in the, uh, between about 600,000 and 400,000 years ago that had very high body masses. So there's, uh, there's a bunch of fossils from Spain from a site called Atapuerca Cima de los Huesos, um, where we have, for example, a complete pelvis and so on. And the body mass reconstructions for those guys are, are well over 100 kilograms. And this is not because they were fat, this is lean body mass. You, you have to imagine, I always imagine them as like large American football players, uh, more or less in, in shape. And so, you know, these guys likely had large, large heads and large teeth, but I don't know why else. It could also be random. I mean, in general, you know, in, in humans, we see a decrease in tooth size over time. And hunter-gatherers in general have larger teeth than agriculturalists. So the, larger te uh, the largest teeth in, in, in present-day humans, you actually find uh, still in Australian Aborigines, where, you know, only a relatively short time passed since they stopped being hunter-gatherers. Um, 
and there are there are, th that is kind of the uh, the top range of the of the of Australian Aborigines is roughly where Denisovans fall, but uh, but otherwise um, otherwise we don't really know. I mean, really, we have now we have three teeth that are clearly Denisovan. We have the cranial fragment, we have a finger bone, um, and then we have the mandible from China. But that's it. So it's it's very it's very limited. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. I, uh, I have a question about your uh, uh, high homozygosity in this one case mm -hmm. where you had the high, uh, high coverage. Do you have a lot of uh, Denisovan individuals where you get this high coverage that you can actually make uh, allelic calls? No. And no? Okay. No, we have, we have a single Denisovan for which we have high coverage, and we have now three Neanderthals. Um, one with like 50 fold, one 37 fold and so on. But I mean, yeah, I mean, when we first got the high coverage from the Denisovan, we had the problem that this was 2011, there were very few high coverage modern human genomes. So we actually had to sequence modern human genomes to the same coverage as, as we had this Denisovan genome, which, which is quite, quite surprising. It's, uh, do you need this this uh, high coverage to make uh, allele calls, or can you can you go with something um, less than that as well? You can you can go with less. I mean, not for you can't do homozygosity. The problem is is really the DNA damage, yeah. um, and and the uh, you have at the at the end of the fragments the last about three bases. Um, you can usually more or less throw away, um, and yeah. Um, so you have to, you, you, you need decent coverage. If you have one fold coverage, you have to be extremely careful. Um, we usually find either you can't get anything out of it, you know, uh, practically, practically nothing and you just stop. Um, if, if there's decent DNA preservation, you usually just sequence till you have the high coverage. I mean, it's, it's not that expensive these days anymore. That really is, I think, the big difference. And then I have a, a practical, I guess, digging practice question to follow up on this. If you know that uh, Denise Evans lived in a given locale and you probably by now know a little bit about which are the best spots for DNA to be preserved. Are you digging in those spots where you think there might be a high chance of it to be preserved or do you, what's, what's your strategy to, to dig in a certain place but not another? Um... No, I mean, we, we usually really like finding human remains is, is, the, is, is really the exception. So we, we work in areas where we know that humans were there because we have stone tools, for example. Um, and then after that, it's just luck, really. Uh, especially getting DNA out of it is, is pure luck. I mean, I, I, I do like to work in the Altai because in general, you have better DNA preservation than you would have, for example, in, in uh, South China. Um, or, or Indonesia, you know, it would be interesting. I'm, I think there, there will be Denisovans in Indonesia, but the problem will be, I don't think we'll ever get DNA out of them um, because uh, warm, especially humid climates are, are very bad for ancient DNA preservation. Um, this is also a huge problem in the Near East. Um, we know that Neanderthals and modern humans um, co-occurred in, in the Near East and there likely was also gene flow there but I don't think anyone managed to extract DNA from anything older than about 10,000 years in, in the Near East. While in Siberia, we pretty routinely go over 100,000. And I mean, the oldest we have is from Spain, from Atoperca Simula Los Suezos. We actually have DNA going back to 430,000 years or so. Um, but it's extremely little. I think it's total, it's uh, 6 million bases from... Uh, uh, from from the genome and and we we calculated that for uh, one fold coverage uh, of the genome we'd have to use about one and a half kilograms of bone, which you know is is kind of hard to convince someone to you know most of your Neanderthal is gone now because we want the DNA. Um, we usually take samples of of like fifty milligrams or so. So. <laughs> It's a limitation. The, the protein work that is happening now is, is very promising, um, which you know has, has many issues because um, 
proteins don't evolve neutrally and, and you're very limited. You know, you, you're gonna have a few proteins in the enamel um, that's not as useful as having a whole genome, but you can go back much further. There's now uh, protein data from, from fossils that are several million years old. So that is, I think uh, that, that might be the way we can, we can identify fossils in Indonesia or, or maybe even New Guinea. I mean, there's a, there's a paper that looked at, um, at the genomics of uh, Papuans and they proposed that there was a last gene flow event between Denisovans and Papuans um, less than 20,000 years ago, which if that's true, that would have had to happen in, in New Guinea. Um, I'm not completely sure. I, I talked to Svante and some, some people in his team and they are very skeptical of this data. So, but I mean, if it's true, it would be amazing to find Denisovans there. But there's, I don't think there's any archeological site in New Guinea that's older than 30,000 years old. And there's nothing that's clearly a non-modern human. So we don't know. Well, thank you very much uh, to, to everybody, in particular, of course, uh, our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Viola uh, from the University of Toronto. It was an absolutely spectacular, fascinating, insightful, exciting uh, talk and a lot of questions certainly still to be investigated. Thanks to all the participants. Thank you for uh, your great questions uh, and stay tuned for more exciting Asana virtual talks. And uh, I wish you all a good day and stay safe wherever you are. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone.